charlie can you uh, uh can you make sure that can i share my video i'm not able to undo my video okay let me um uh, yes uh, Um, your video is sharing, Tejendra. Yeah. Yeah, you're. I think you're good. Yep. Okay. Well, <laughs> good day, everyone. I'm sorry for the scramble. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I had serious power outages in my town this morning. Um, but good day. This is uh, welcome to the International Association for the Study of the Commons third annual World Commons Week event. Um, my name is Charlie Schweik. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in the USA. I'm a member of the International Association for the Study of the Commons Executive Council, and I'm the organizer of the World Commons Week event. Um, as you may know, World Commons Week is a global annual event um, celebrating and promoting both commons research and practice. And it's got two primary components. One is a coordinated local events around the world and a set of regional and continental keynote uh, webinars. Um, this webinar is a special one. Um, this is the first time, this is the third World Commons Week year. It's the first time we've done this. And in this uh, webinar that's uh, two hours long, um, we're celebrating the ISC Early Career Network. And here we'll be highlighting the research of um, the Early Career Network scholars that are shown on your screen. Uh, I really appreciate, appreciate the uh, efforts by everyone on the screen that will be introduced in a minute. Uh, it's really been a remarkable effort to put this panel together. And as some of you may know, they also had a, uh, a mini conference this earlier this week that I've heard went really well. Um, I'd like to welcome Tejendra Gautam of the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay, India. Uh, who will be acting as the moderator for this webinar and will be introducing our speakers. So um, to ensure the webinar functions well, um, we've limited video to the speaker and moderators, uh, to the speakers and moderators, and the audio for the attendees is muted. Um, attendees, that doesn't mean you can't ask questions. Um, you'll, uh, there's a, on the bottom of your screen, as you scroll your mouse around your screen, if you're not familiar with Zoom, there's a Q&A function at the bottom. That's what we'll ask you to use. And I will be monitoring that Q&A window as well as Tejendra. Um, and uh, that's uh, the place where we ask you to type in your questions. I'm gonna let Tejendra um, describe the um, agenda um, in a moment. Uh, and and the, the last thing I'll just say is if it appears when we're getting to the question and answers that you we need a dialogue between you and the speaker, I'll unmute you. So um, let me uh, introduce Tejendra, who is going to be the moderator. Tejendra is a PhD candidate for the Center of Policy Studies at the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, India. Before joining uh, the PhD um, program, he worked uh, with a couple civil society organizations his research interests involve, uh, well, work in the area of political ecology of forest rights and the Forest Rights Act, uh, tribal development, and forest governance. So, Tejendra, we really appreciate you taking your time and moderating today. Um, let me let you turn it over to you to introduce the panelists and describe the agenda. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. Um, good afternoon, all. Maybe good evening, depend on the time zone. This is the first talk that a member of IAC Early Career Network is coming together for a, uh, for a joint venture. And I would like to introduce by uh, introducing Maria uh, Gerales. She is a PhD candidate uh, from University of Bonn, Germany. And Barry is also a PhD candidate from University Berlin, Germany. And Dan is also is joining from Arizona State University. He is a, a PhD candidate at Center for Behavior. And uh, Hita Unikishnan, uh, uh, Newton International Fellow from Urban Institute uh, at University of Sheffield, UK, is joining us for this talk. So, uh, 
so i will uh, now transfer the uh, my discussion to panelist they can now initiate Okay, well, then I will take from here. Thank you for the introduction, Sajendra. Thank you, Charlie, for getting us um, heartbeat really pumped. I think <laughs> we were worried for you for whole 30 minutes. But, um, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It's fine. I think, I think we were lacking some adrenaline, so now we are really pumped. Um, but most importantly, thank you for inviting us, actually, to do the first ever early career keynote of the World Commons Week and uh, trusting us with a collective keynote as ours. Um, before we start, I want to situate our talks for our audience, because this is uh, quite unusual. In our collective keynote, consisting of five interrelated yet individual talks, we want to take you through some of the social ecological chain challenges that we um, observe or anticipate in our uh, current research endeavors. In face of the interrelated uh, ecological, economic and health crises, I think it is safe to say that we are not necessarily experiencing a shortage of challenges. And uh, many communities of the global um, majority literally happen to find themselves in these crises due to successful cost shifting strategies of producers elsewhere. Some of these problems are historical geographically situated. Some are driven by biophysical changes in the ecological systems that are, however, uh, also not decoupled from our activities, from the way we produce and consume. Some may even emerge in the name of sustainability as sustainability embodies many battle lines, multiple interests and meanings. I mean, we mine deserts for electromobility that is allegedly clean and on the way helps us to take a couple of sustainable development goals. But I mind you, this is not a dystopian talk because we are also not in shortage of innovative alternative ways to build and lead meaningful, sustainable lives. We are observing an abundance of responses from the affected communities to these challenges. And the culminating responses look different and they take their strength from a variety of institutional and commons approaches situated in divergent life struggles. As such, we can be inspired by these, by chances uh, for an, an alternatives of equitable sustainability transformations driven by the powerhouse of communities. This is also a chance for our community of researchers and practitioners to use this momentum and stress the importance of commons within the emerging discourses of future beyond mainstream growth paradigms. However, this also means being cognizant of the plurality of conceptions of commons and commoning by and for different actors. This implies being aware of productive divergencies that will help us base our commoning on solid grounds and allowing space for these divergencies instead of colonizing or silencing them. Today's keynote consists of two parts. Hita will open us, open the first round and take us straight to Bengaluru, India. Uh, from an historical perspective, she will elucidate how intra-community heterogeneities have driven social ecological transformations over the years in urban commons. Up next, Dane, um, using the institutional analysis and development framework, will focus on how a polycentric approach and focus on lake health have led to persistent lake systems in Wisconsin, USA. I will take you back east to Central Asia where I will talk about challenges brought upon by gold mining to local social ecological systems in Kyrgyzstan and role of institutions in delivering a, a coordinated response to these challenges. We will have 15 minutes of um, questions and answers, immediate questions, and following that, Maria and Flavia will take us to uh, the European context. Maria will start and introduce us to the problems brought about by the intensified agriculture over the last hundred years and how a context dependent SES perspective uh, to seed breeding may resolve some of these problems. Last but not least, Flavia will acquaint us, at least some of us, with geographical indications as possible tools for sustainable development. And then she will talk um, about what the new EU environmental um, sustainability measures might actually mean for the sustainability and resilience of geographical indications. Hita will wrap up our talk with closing remarks. I hope, I wish you all an interesting journey through um, time and space. Hita, the floor is yours. 
Thanks, Beryl. Um, good afternoon, evening, morning to everyone from whichever time zone that you're logging in from. Today, I'll talk a bit about my work on historical commons and their relevance towards crafting tools for sustainable urban futures. In this presentation, I will touch upon the relevance of including historical perspectives, the value of collating uh, data from multiple historical sources, and follow it up with some nice things that such research can uncover, drawing on our work in the South Indian city of Bangalore. Um, in the next slide, um, I will talk about how there has been a lot of recognition that historical studies of urban commons transformations, path dependencies in environmental governance, uh, etc., are quite few. This gap has been referred to as a poverty of history in the commons and essentially also reflects some of the challenges of working with historical data. Uh, for example, historical data can uh, be textual. It can take the form of archival uh, data. It can take the form of maps. It can take the form of audio and video files. Um, it can be oral recollections from people that may not often be clear on dates or events. It can use a multiplicity of calendar systems and the same place can bear multiple variations on the name and jurisdictional boundaries can keep changing. Further and more practical terms, access and availability of historical data can be very limited. For example, you might get a lot of information about uh, big cities, but not so much on smaller cities. Now, these challenges notwithstanding, working with historical data can be fun, exciting, and very rewarding. Now, on your screen, you see the place that I am working from, which is the metropolitan city of Bangalore. It is the capital of the state of Karnataka, which is a shaded part in the map that you see in front of you. This dot represents the dot that you see there that on that shaded portion represents the position of Bangalore within the state. Most of you will be familiar with the city, even if indirectly. You see, whenever you have a problem with your mobile phone network or your internet, or you buy things from Target or Victoria's Secret or whichever retail agency that you want to, uh, the chances are that the work occurring in the background to either sort out of your problem or enable half of those fabulous deals you may be getting is at least partly situated out of Bangalore, which is the information technology capital of the country. For others, the city is ubiquitous with traffic. What you see in the picture on the top right is a city on a good day. Now this inspires several jokes, you know, the ones that go in India, you drive on the left side of the road, but in Bangalore, you drive on what is left of the road, really. Um, the city also has numerous parks and gardens and has earned itself the title of the Garden City of India. My research, however, does not focus on any of these things. What I concern myself with are the many man-made and networked lakes of the city once built to sustain agrarian communities in what is essentially um, a very semi-arid landscape, but today which have largely disappeared from the cityscape or which are very polluted and vulnerable. I try to look at why they were important to communities, what made them lose their importance, and what did those changes mean for both the people who live and draw benefits from them as well as the city as a whole. Um, next slide, uh, Beryl. I combine historical and contemporary research on the system. Today, I will focus largely on the past. I use a variety of historical data. I work with maps. Now, these maps can take the form of old battle plans, hand-drawn surveys, cadastral maps, or old topo sheets, or village sheets, village maps. I work with officially archived records. These include government reports, correspondences of various kinds, petitions, magazines, speeches, and so on. I also work with oral histories. I interview people and obtain their recollections of the past concerning lakes and how people related to them. Now, this gives me a diversity of perspectives to work with. It also throws up some very unusual and interesting and unexpected finds um, that uh, that is essentially the focus of my talk today. Um, but also, for example, uh, the diversity of perspectives that it throws out is very interesting. For example, maps being drawn for specific purposes cannot tell me much about those features of a landscape that the original cartographer chose to omit, right? Uh, government records represent just one viewpoint, that of regimes corresponding within those records. Oral histories provide a window into perceived changes, nostalgia, you know, the lived experiences of people in a place. Combining these things allows me to construct nuanced perspectives of change around the system that I'm studying. Next. So what do I get out of doing all of this? The first and most obvious is that I get stories of transformation of urban commons. For example, what you see on your screen is a series of maps that show how open wells, which are the dots, and the lakes, which are the blue patches, uh, disappeared between 1885 and 2014 in the, what was colonial Bangalore, you know, the small part of the city where, for which we have data available. Now, there are numbers there for those of you who are interested. There were 1,960 wells in 1885 to about 49 wells in 2014. But what was more interesting for us is how these changing waterscapes were closely linked to the disappearance of those green patches, the, the light green patches that you see there on your screen. Agriculture 
agricultural patches and which was essentially the main dependency that was built around these water bodies it is also reflective of rapid processes of urbanization driving those transformations right so that's that set stage for us to ask what were the processes behind each of these changes that we are seeing on the map was it changing ideas of what urban meant to communities or governance regimes was it conflict was it a combination of these and other things and what did it really mean for farmers who lived off the system in the past next um stories of the past also allow us to get answers to questions of who used the commons who was excluded who remains excluded so what you see on your screens are pictures some of which i've taken around several lakes long before we had written records on paper people left stone carvings or inscriptions etched on stone to tell us their stories in this particular landscape like i mentioned which was semi arid um and starved the water water bodies became symbolic spaces in which to place such records owing to the sacred nature that was imbibed to the resource the two pictures on the top are examples of such records what we call hero stones that tell tales of local conflict bravery cattle raids widow sacrifices and many others another something that stories of the past tell is who used these commons and for what the picture on the bottom right is from a lake that today is converted into a sports stadium our work on this lake showed how the people you see in that particular photograph the farmers the livestock owners the people who are washing their clothes on the banks of the lake these are the people who were slowly excluded the, from the lake which began to embody visualizations of aesthetic and recreational benefits now there is something that continues to occur in the present day leading to temporary hutments and migrant workers who are dependents of those same water bodies becoming its most newest victims of marginalization the next slide studying the past can also tell us how people related to the commons what forms of co-production existed in the past for example the picture on the top left is a victory stone at one lake within the city a victory stone that was placed there by villagers in the region a few centuries ago to honor a woman who was responsible for constructing a lake the story goes that the village was suffering uh, with lack of water and it was the efforts of this woman a humble flower seller who not only invested her life savings into constructing the water body but also went against colonial british authorities to do so the other two pictures on the screen show water management structures which existed in the past the one to the left is an open well which tapped into shallow aquifers recharged by lakes and which served as a secondary source of water for urban residents there were collective rules as to how when and who could access water from these structures and for what purposes the picture to the right of the screen is that of a sluice gate common manually operated structures that were once found around lakes in this part of the world and which regulated the flow of water into farms that were irrigated by that particular water body now the architecture especially if you see uh, the the bottom left of that particular picture you would find that there are certain carvings on that pillar like thing there right um, and the architecture of those structures usually provide insight into who built them for what and when and they were also uh these are also structures that were operated by designated community members and the way they were paid for their services was by receiving a share from the harvest produced by surrounding farms in return for ensuring adequate water supply reached the particular crops next slide using a historical frame to look at urban commons also helped me draw out nuances about how these spaces transform both physically and within public imaginations why such changes occur and what that means for a rapidly changing urban landscape the pictures you see on your screen are all reflective of such transformations the first picture on the top left shows a number of hero stones or victory stones that i referred to earlier forming the base of a building once strewn about on a grove of trees on the bank of a lake today preserved in this manner by local communities these stones are largely undated but represent one of those accidental finds that tell you a lot about people's relationships with each other and with the waterscape pre-colonial and to some extent colonial india had a very barbarous custom in which women who were widowed were sacrificed on the funeral pyres of their husbands a practice that was known as sati while this tradition has been well documented through carved victory stones in northern and central india it was considerably less prevalent down south but however certain motifs on these stones for example if you look at that particular picture on the top left uh, you see one where the male is holding something like a knife to his neck while the woman stands in supplication now these kinds of structures are identical to such stones elsewhere in the country suggesting that bangalore has had a particularly gruesome past in this respect and that it occurred next to a water body indicative again of the sacred nature of the water body other commons associated with the lake such as temple tanks or what we call ashwat kattes which are essentially ficus religiosa trees or uh, neem trees placed next to each other 
along with representations of deities remain uh, you know uh, important to communities but have undergone dramatic transformations the picture on the top right is that of one such ashwat kate it was once the village seat of justice where elders would sit and you know dispense um, justice to minor problems uh, today is a minor attraction within one of the most iconic par parks of the city similarly on the bottom left is what remains of a temple tank a sort of step well associated with religious structures that provided additional water security today filled in because communities are no longer dependent upon it the space has transformed into another form of commons not without intense contestation between state and, uh, and and communities into somewhere where communities can gather together to celebrate collective festivities or where underprivileged children from local government schools can gather to play or learn things like dance or kung fu next slide so i mentioned earlier that i've been working around the lakes of bangalore but my descriptions in the talk touch upon a number of other things that are not so lake related but rather are connected loosely to the water body now being able to adopt a historical frame helps me draw out some of these systemic connections that existed in the past for example the structure of a village in this particular city of bangalore revolved around interconnections between multiple commons the lake being at the center of them all and probably the most important in addition there were other commons the structure in the top right is what remains of a collectively managed and appropriated cattle shed often found next to a lake similarly other structures too were present around the water body a village forest known locally as a gundatop which formed a collectively managed communal resource for fuel timber fruit and shade a cemetery to bury people and animals temples communal threshing grounds the ashwat kate all of these were integral to the system and connected to each other the social structure of communities too was built around these systemic connections and by this this is not to say that these social structures were in any way egalitarian or equitable there were economic caste gender disparities among the populations and the roles that society gave them what i'm trying to highlight here is that these nuances would not have emerged if i had not adopted a mixed methods historical perspective to draw out what the landscape looked like in the past what this also means for us as se scholars is that defining a system and its boundaries especially for medium to large interconnected ones such as these lakes now becomes a more complicated exercise next uh again no description of commons of any form especially those within the global south can be complete without belief structures or systems surrounding them what you see on your screen are pictures of various kinds of temples situated on banks of different lakes in the city usually dedicated to female deities and in many cases taken care of by women priests each of these represent belief systems drawing on the symbolic nature of water both as an enabler for example domestic water household water irrigation etc but also a destroyer in the form of floods disease death and so on several oral traditions have also been passed down generations in the form of songs celebrating the interconnection between people's lives and their commons the picture to the right of the screen is a representation of a deity called upon in the oldest festival of the city it is called the karaga it is an 11 day celebration also to a female deity called upon uh, you know uh, in relation to their to their dependence on water uh, the festivities involve processions that actually move from one water body to the next in the city and what is interesting is that the celebration also evokes memories of those water bodies that have since been converted into other other structures the procession still visits those waterless sites even today it is celebrated by a community of horticulturists who migrated into the city in about the 16th century and is reflective of their in in intimate relationship with water that once sustained and supported their livelihoods next um now that brings me to my next slide These are pictures of how different occupational groups and lifestyles celebrate their connection to urban water even when they have switched professions to more what may be called more urban ones in many cases. So the picture on the top left is a shrine on the banks of a lake and in the middle of an agricultural patch in the heart of the city. It is dedicated to a deity that they believe ensures enough water to sustain their crops but not flood the field. The picture in the middle of the top row and the one to the bottom left are both placed by livestock owners on the bund or what you would potentially know as the embankment of the lake worship so that they get abundant pas pasturage and water for the animals the picture to the top right showing what looks like pyramidal structures made out of mud are those built by people who provide commercial laundry services only in this case they wash each article of clothing by hand uh, in the shallow waters of the lake these structures were built as part of a celebration that seeks divine protection for unattended children and articles of clothing left in their care The other three pictures all relate to how individual people too hold and have held these common sacred and important to rituals of birth death 
puberty, marriage, childbirth, and so on. This is despite the fact that we are talking about a rapidly urbanizing metropolitan city, um, which is surrounding all of these communities. The loss of dependency on lakes owing to centralized long distance water supply systems and increasing vulnerabilities in the form of pollutions, encroachments, conversions of the water body itself. It is also these groups of people who have historically and in the present day found themselves excluded from decision making around the spaces that were once integral to supporting their lives and livelihoods. Next. Getting a sense of these perspectives is very important. Uh, not just from the perspective of the city, but also from the perspective of us as uh, larger common scholars. From the point of view of the city, these are important because the most that, you know, urban residents get reminded of these connections with local water bodies occurs during monsoons, when large parts of the, water, of the city flood over and there is loss of life or property, or when significant resources are spent in pumping away water from flooded properties. From the point of view of social ecological system studies in general, the use of historical perspectives brings greater nuance uh, into how we describe the complexity of a social ecological system. It allows us to engage with ideas of intra-community heterogeneity. For example, the fact that there is a lot of diversity in the ways different occupational groups connect to a resource. And this has implications for how we understand the term community in terms like community-led governance or community-led stewardship of a resource. Also, more importantly, it allows us to get a sense of path dependencies. How have we got to where we are today? What are the processes that led us here? What forms of inequities have perpetuated through time? And what kind of inequities are being newly created? What does that mean for designing sustainable urban spaces? Which brings me to my final point. Like someone pointed out to me quite recently, history is when we begin to start speaking about contexts and context-dependent pathways. But the challenge for medium to large-scale social ecological systems in general is to avoid falling into the trap of highly specific theory or oversimplifications. In other words, what is needed is a balance between panaceas and overly contextual solutions. And perhaps it would be good to think about how historical studies of social ecological systems can move along in that direction. Thanks. Well, thank you, Hida. That was great. So I'm going to speak next. Um, my name is Dane Whitaker. And uh, before I get started, uh, I want to say how grateful I am to the IASC and especially Charlie, Hita, Beryl, Maria, and Flavia, and Tejindra for the opportunity to share what I've learned um, from the Wisconsin Lakes Partnership with you. Um, and I want to acknowledge that what I share today is knowledge that's been accumulated by lake users and lovers over decades. And I'm just the messenger who's sharing it with you today. So next. Uh, my brief talk will have two sections, an introduction into the Wisconsin Lakes Partnership, and second, um, I'll talk about how the partnership inspires my vision for a common conservation future. So I won't spend a lot of time explaining why desert-dwelling Arizonian is studying uh, lake social ecological systems, but don't worry, the irony isn't lost on me. Um, but I'll leave you with three words, summer field season. Um, so Wisconsin is found in the north central part of the United States and has over 15,000 freshwater lakes, which you can see on that map on the right. Many of these lakes were left behind as glaciers receded 10,000 years ago. There's a high concentration of the lakes in the North Highland Lakes District, which is shown in yellow on the USGS map. The unique geography of the Northern Highland Lakes District has made it home, the home of many research studies, including much of Steve Carpenter's limnological work and the NSF uh, project that this research is funded through. The North Highlands Lake District is mostly rural and comprised of counties supported by tourism and forestry industries. Most of the de developments around the lakes are second homes, resorts, and camps. Next. So lakes are highly valued for their recreational aesthetic and scenic qualities, and they're treasured for their fresh water. Lakes are important habitat and food resources for fish, aquatic life, birds, and wildlife. But these ecosystems are fragile. They can go undergo rapid environmental changes, often leading to significant declines in their aesthetic, recreational, and aquatic ecosystem functions. Exposed to external effects from the atmosphere, their watersheds, and groundwater, lakes are subject to change through time, and human activities can further accelerate the rates of change, such as the use of phosphorus heavy fertilizers, or some of the development practices you see on the right side of this uh, slide. Um, 
But if the changes, if the causes of the changes are known, um, human intervention through lake management can control or even reverse these detrimental changes. So we have 15,000 lakes with many human and non-human stakeholders. We have fast and slow feedbacks to the system from the regulatory environment, changing environment, climate change, and land use change. How do you increase resilience of such an uh, important social ecological system? Next. So Wisconsin realized that no one entity can do this job alone. The Wisconsin Lakes Partnership brings science, education, and citizens together to empower people to care for Wisconsin's lakes. Since its genesis in the early 1970s, the Wisconsin Lakes Partnership has been recognized nationally as a gold standard model, model of collaboration. The Wisconsin Lakes Partnership is comprised of three partners. At the top, you see the Department of Natural Resources, which supplies scientific research, technical expertise, and regulatory authority. Um, in the bottom right, you see the Extension Lakes Program, which provides supporting educational materials and programs. And then last but not least, in the bottom left, you see Wisconsin Lakes, um, which mobilizes citizens to be advocates for the lakes. So this partnership you see here is a statewide multifaceted effort that reaches that has reaches far beyond the three core groups to include regional, county, tribal, nonprofit, and federal partners. The goal of the partnership is to continue to protect and preserve Wisconsin's waters and support those meeting the challenges that come with management and stewardship of Wisconsin lakes. So within this polycentric governance structure, we asked the following question. Next. How do the institutional design principles affect lake outcomes? And in particular, we're interested uh, at the local level. Next. So to answer this question, we conducted semi-structured interviews with 31 lake organizations representing 39 lakes across Vilas County. We chose Vilas County because Vilas County has 120 of the 600 Wisconsin lake organizations and 1,300 of the 15,000 Wisconsin lakes. Uh, all within this small geographic area. In the interviews, we asked the lake organizations about the design principles and their goals. Next. We found that lake organizations employed the design principles uniformly with the exception of exclusion, graduated sanctions, and conflict resolution, which you can see boxed in red. Uh, this is likely due to the educational materials and programs provided by the UW Extension Lakes Program and the Wisconsin legal recognition of volunteer-based lake or management organizations. Um, for the three exceptions, we found exclusion is rarely employed because we sampled lakes with public access under the assumption that there would be more collective action challenges. When we did see exclusion, that showed up in uh, generally in the biophysical um, nature. So uh, maybe a boat ramp was too steep for certain types of boats to launch or to access a lake, you had to pass through a culvert that went under a road, and so smaller, only smaller boats would get through it. We also saw variation in graduated sanctions and conflict resolution. Some lake organizations did not want to be perceived as policed by their neighbors, and others had uh, more visitors on their lake and would gently remind people um, that the rule about the rules before following more severe pathways. So they were using graduated sanctions while um, the previous were not. And then finally, uh, lakes without conflict resolution generally had not uh, experienced conflict. Many of these organizations um, had not experienced conflict and so they had not developed the mechanisms. The ones that had used, been used like their annual meetings um, or worked with uh, Department of Natural Resource Scientists to resolve conflict that emerged um, within the organization. Next. So we had hoped to find just a few goals um, and lots of diversity in design principles. We kind of found the inverse. Um, and we were surprised by the number and variety of goals cited by these lake organizations. Uh, we, um, so what you see is uh, 11 categories of goals here on this slide, um, ranging from lake stewardship to property values. Um, what you see at the top is kind of more general goals. We had expected to see more specific goals like fishery management, property values, and water clarity, which can be seen in the bottom half um, of those goals. Um, and instead, the most cited goals focused on overall system health with an emphasis on aquatic invasive species. Um, and as you can see, the goals include social, 
uh, like community building goals, they include environmental goals like habitat restoration, and they include economic goals like property values. So while we found um, that the institutional design principles were important to like social ecological outcomes, um, they were not sufficient to explain the outcomes if we didn't include contextual variables, things like uh, the nutrient levels or the building density around the lake. Next. So in summary, we found that a focus on overall uh, resource health can afford cooperation when users have diverse preferences. For example, in lake organizations focused on lake stewardship, different stakeholder groups such as fishers, homeowners, and water skiers all bought in. Um, additionally, the Wisconsin Lakes Partnership is a great example of polycentric resource management. Citizens with place-based knowledge work alongside government agencies and academics uh, to inform policy programs and resource allocation. So I wanna conclude with, um, next slide. I want to conclude with uh, a vision for a my vision for a common conservation future. I imagine a future where resource management decisions include people with place-based knowledge. Those who interact with the resource most often have an equal voice to government agencies and academics. I imagine a future where discussion of underlying infrastructure or ecology of a system allows for resilience where people with diverse goals and preferences can work together for overall system health. And I think we're well on our way there. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm trying to show my video. I'm not able to do that. Sorry. I'm trying to help too, Beryl. Um, um, it used to be fine, Charlie. I don't know what happened. Um, I'll tell you what, I'm going to withdraw co-host permission and then give it back to you, see if that resets it. Okay. Are you seeing at the bottom of your screen um, the, the start video um, toggle where you can turn it on and off? Have you tried that? Um, yeah, you're sh because you've you got the PowerPoint, it's probably complicating your screen. Um, try to find the Zoom window and see if you can find your start, start video. Or if you want, stop sharing for a second. Thanks, okay. uh, audience okay. members. We'll we'll get this. There you go, Beryl. Okay, now start show, sharing again. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Very good. I was just gonna. So you you hear me and you see me, right? Sure do. That's right. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Before starting, I was just going to take uh, the blame for the possible mismatches between the slides and the contents and then I just I think messed up my own video so well let's <laughs> move on to mining uh, and the topic I want to talk about um, global consumption um, preferences over the last um, six seven decades have been advancing the commodity frontiers incessantly as accessible resources diminish the mining industry pushes the frontiers further and deeper resistance worldwide to mining is increasing Today, uh, in my talk, I want to take you to Kyrgyzstan, one such resource frontier where mining, gold mining particularly, has been main driver of industrial growth, however, also injustices and gradiences. Affected communities resist this extractive expansion. Challenged by this, market and state actors counteract to delegitimize the protest movements. Both community protests and reactions to them are by now part and parcel of the contemporary neoliberal resource governance. I want to share you my observations of the last years on what drives this resistance in Kyrgyzstan. And I do have to add that giving this talk today feels a little surreal because um, since Sunday, uh, when, when we had in Kyrgyzstan the parliamentary elections, there have been massive revolts in the country, including attacks to significant mines. Um, so these are indeed, indeed times for Kyrgyzstan. 
Kyrgyzstan is um, a mineral resource dependent uh, country in Central Asia that has been through gold mining uh, come to constitute a commodity frontier over the last 25, uh, 30 years. However, licensing sizable deposits in Kyrgyzstan has not been only a resource, um, a source for um, finances, but also public discontent with the way state manages the sector. In 2015, I commenced my research exploring different sentiments towards gold mining, and by then, resistance to mining has long become a constituent of um, countries' mining politics. I started my research in Bishkek. After all, uh, Bishkek is the center of mining uh, governance and companies first stop for acquiring a license. This is also hence where the commodity chain starts within the national borders. And through licensing transactions, then uh, companies might um, be able to pursue their uh, gold mining projects. In some cases, such as Arlovka, it may lead to gold mining, bringing back hopes for a good life. In other cases, such as Maidan, a meaningful life in harmony with local social natures precludes the expansion of mining into their lives. After roughly 60 years of um, being part of the Soviet Union, in 91, Kyrgyzstan becomes independent, becomes an independent republic. And this also marks the beginning of the gold rush for the country. You might remember that um, uh, late 80s, 90s, uh, Washington, post-Washington consensus uh, started to reign the day where countries like Kyrgyzstan were told to get the institutions right, to be able to catch up. This meant rapid liberalization, deregulation, and privatization. And Kyrgyzstan obediently followed these prescriptions for reforming the economic and political order. Opening up the country invited international investors who were interested in gold mining projects. And only after a year of independence, Kyrgyzstan became a player in the commodity markets through licensing its largest gold deposit, Kumtor, uh, mind you, permafrost mining at 4,000 meters above sea level. Gold mining has since then become the mainstay of the economy, contributing around 10% to the GDP and 40% to foreign trade. By now, there are nine operational gold mines, and gold accounts for 90% of the mining industry. Mining um, development of uh, extractive industries in Kyrgyzstan continues to be a national priority in the name of the greater common good. Local resistance um, against gold mining, on the other hand, has been on the rise since 2010 as a reaction to this expansion. Today, I want to take you to two specific locations. One is Arlovka on the right uh, upper hand side in the north, uh, northern part of the country that hosts the largest, third largest gold deposit in the country. And Maidan um, in the south uh, of the country, home to one of the most protracted conflicts in the country that has been now going on for seven years. These conflicts in Kyrgyzstan are driven by structural factors that are rooted in um, weak governance and lack of institutional trust. With risks and costs distributed to local scale, extractive expansion is encroaching on the local ecosystems, livelihoods and cultural commons that altogether um, perpetuate the grievances. As such, different positions on mining coexist. We, we observe different regulations, um, regularities of behavior, institutions that unfold as shades of conflict at different scales rather than clear cut conflicts or cooperative uh, positions. Affected communities are experimenting and crafting institutions in reaction to this expansion that fail to um, take into account their valuations in the first place. In case of Arlovka, resistance means accepting the gold mine, but rejecting the institutional incongruence between rules and form and use that produces and deepens socio-ecological injustices. On the other hand, in Maidan, resistance means defending own life projects that they have meticulously rebuilt following the independence that are, however, not aligned with the neoliberal project. As a result, new concessions coexist with licensed ones, but are not developed due to lack of social license to operate. Social license to operate is just one example of the institutions that has come to life, driven by bottom-up collective action in a response to institutional design that initially excluded the participation of those who are affected the most. Let us now zoom into each of these geographies. Um, located in northern Kyrgyzstan, Arlovka used to be a place of prominence, prosperity, and pride. It was a model mining town built for and by mining um, industrial complex and flourished on this basis during the Soviet Union. 
The residents reminisce about those days as an era of development that was unique for Kyrgyzstan. With the dissolution and no enterprise to maintain, um, people, um, most people deserted um, Arlovka. The first 10 years hit the people hard, psychologically as well as economically. The residents who stayed in Arlovka described these years following the regime change as a phase of depression in which all went, yet new did not come. In 2000, however, the prospects for a new mine became real, and eventually, um, in 2012, the Altenk and Gold Mine started its operations. And Arlovka has been since then praised as a repackaged neoliberal model mining by the state and corporate actors. It is a good cooperative community that does not go against the accent mode of governance. Is that so? The extractive realities on the ground are, however, one of entanglements and are far from discourses that try to showcase Arlovka as a good community while trying to demoralize other resistant communities that go against mining. Despite being recalled uh, to life through hopes of improvement, fairly soon euphoria left as place to disappointment in Arlovka. And um, it was it, it costed a series of protests and ensuing bargaining process that the community granted social license to operate. They signed a partnership agreement that ensured investment in social infrastructure, a hiring quota favoring local dwellers, as well as environmental monitoring in line with legal framework. This was in 2013. And since then, mining company well, has been able to operate without um, major disruptions. However, activists on the ground have since then not stopped resorting to different forms of um, resistance for their rights to information and to participate in decisions concerning their lives. With signing the agreement, the company received the social license. In the aftermath, however, the implementation of this agreement, as well as the concerns of affected people, lost their importance. People to date resort to resistance that is guided by perception of environmental and social injustices in an effort to attune it to incongruence. Incongruence that is between the written and enforced rules and incongruence between neoliberal promises of progress and illiberal reality of caution and disenchantment. Moving southwards, we have Maidan. Um, it is a rural community in the agricultural heart of the uh, country. Prior to independence during Soviet reign, uh, most people in Maidan worked in collective um, or state farms. During the transition, uh, life was similarly difficult um, in Maidan as in Arlovka. However, with land reform towards the end of 90s, uh, most people uh, were able to uh, start uh, start with something. And so they started working their land and dealing with animal husbandry, engaging in cross-border commerce. What, while what was left of our local fell in depression, into depression, in Maidan over time, people have got good at horticulture and animal uh, husbandry. As such, they have seen that they can, they can make a living uh, with their land and livestock. And so they, they started standing back on their feet. It is said against this background that in 2007, a um, junior exploration company discovers gold reserves in Maidan. After years of geological works, in 2013, the company brought in the first excavator for starting the construction phase. And this triggered a mass protest of 200 people assaulting the company representatives. Um, in the aftermath, Maidan would hit the headlines as the erratic, irrational community that stopped the mining works and that hinders the country from its development. During my research there, I found a bit more than this overly reductionist angle. The company started working in 2007. However, it was not until 2013, six years, 2013, that the protests got the company to really start engaging with the community when it was already a mess. Um, the company seemed not to have talked to people in Maidan and people there found about the plans only through a bless and, and they start a protest. They didn't know what else to do and I was told that it was only with organized action that they felt they could have um, an impact. Why would I want gold? was a rhetorical question I received um, many times. People have rebuilt their lives and now the state wants to um, wants open cast gold mining. People um, expect no benefits uh, from mining. Not wanting the mine or mines uh, in Kyrgyzstan are framed as opposition. They're opposing. Why are they opposing the, the progress um, of the country when it's blessed with all the richness? The question is rarely, what is their position or what are their positions? Material motives are cited as driving mm, forces, but little effort goes really 
into understanding what this materiality entails and what why it matters. For the government and the company, Maidan is just sitting on a gold mine. They see gold where Maidan sees the threat of destruction of everything they have built in the last 25 years, enclosure of their commons for something. For gold, they have known would be no good to them. The license changed hands by now, but the new licensee has no access to the site either. The picture on the right uh, hand side bottom says in Kyrgyz, go away. And this reflects the sentiments rightly. My understanding of Maidan and what has happened since 2007 has nothing to do with self-interested motivations or national, uh, rational egoism or with resource nationalism. It is about having a place and position, about trust and sense of responsibility. It's about things that are simply not negotiable and about the plausibility of a life that can be fulfilling and prosperous yet beyond mainstream conception of progress. Ostrom, in her beautiful 98 paper, argues for a behavioral approach to rational choice theory um, of collective action that goes beyond selfish economic man as the single model of behavior. She underlines the heterogeneity of human behavior and warns us of policies based on assumptions of citizens as narrow-minded rational egoists as these policies crowd out citizenship and collective action. Kyrgyzstan started its neoliberal extractive uh, experiment by following the advice of uh, getting the rules right. Rules that looked good on paper meant on the one hand reckless privatization and on the other hand implied selective enforcement and limited uh, citizenship participation. Ostrom reminds us that getting the rules right is rarely ever possible at first. Trial and error, as well as conflict, might as well be instrumental features um, of this process before individuals can find rules that accommodate their collective rules. She stresses it is the ordinary people who craft and sustain the institutions of everyday life. Conflict transformation, as in the case of Kyrgyzstan or in parts of Latin America, are manifestations of exactly this experimentation. Resi resistance is driving institutional innovation, and it is true resistance that affected communities are taking up their space and resource governance and reclaiming their rights to decisions that affect their lives. People react to mining differently for different reasons. They do meet on a common ground. They resist valuations and discourses that dispossess them of their rights to build and lead meaningful lives, however divergent these may look. These reactions cannot be reduced to rational choice. Motives, these are efforts to counter the self-interest of mineral governance that flattens out their, their life exigencies. Ensuing responses to both in Maidan and Arlovka can hence be better understood through the lens of communities commoning for futures that are in line with their values and what they care about. From gold fields to California, in California to Kyrgyzstan, conflicts are fought in different valuation languages and slowly but truly influencing the rules of the game. The reactive caution and delegitimization strategies of governments and private actors attest to the transformative power of resistance as it challenges and threatens the hegemony for opening of spaces for alternative futures. Thank you. Thank you, Eril, for an interesting talk. Uh, now the floor is open for uh, questions. Uh, I would request from the attendees, if there is a, they have any question, please type, type in the chat box or, or in the questions answer session section. Uh, so there is a one question from Dan for Hita and Beryl that uh, changes in overall political environment, such as colonial or Soviet Union impacted lakes and mining. If we were to look to the future, are there political or economical changes that you anticipate having a similar impact? So I would request to Hita if she wants to answer that. Um, sure. Uh, well, a lot of what I have looked at in the past also bears a lot of continuities in the present day. Um, for example, uh, in the 1990s, um, which is far more recent than 
my usual um, engagement with the with stories of the past. Uh, Indian con Indian India started experimenting with this whole idea of neoliberalism. It started, um, you know, sort of um, trying to get public private partnerships to engage with stakeholders, um, not in terms of building new infrastructure, but at least in terms of maintaining new in uh, maintaining infrastructure such as lakes and stuff. Um, and that was something that had a very similar impact because in 2015 or so, when we actually visited some of these lakes that were privatized, what we found was essentially this, that the lake had become, uh, you know, it had kind of transformed from utilitarian structures into something that was fostering recreational and aesthetic benefits. So the diversity of people who drew uh, benefits from the resource, and they still exist, you still have urban forages, you still have farming, you still have, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, livestock grazing that occurs around the lake in the city of Bangalore, which uh, is kind of incongruous with its urban image, but it still goes on. And all of these people being excluded uh, by a lake that A, sets itself up behind a paywall. So only if you have the money, you can actually enter the lake. If you have a camera, then you pay more, you know, that kind of a thing. And that applies to even, for example, things like a mobile phone camera. So a lot of people find themselves excluded from the lake. Then they set up gates. So there is this whole uh, process, a whole thing about uh, what enclosing the commons that's going on even today. So a lot of residents welfare associations more recently have come together to sort of uh, manage and appropriate uh, the, uh, you know, the lakes that they uh, find in, in around their communities. A lot of that is driven by upper middle class to middle class people and often reflects only their ideals. Um, so, you know, let's build a walkway around the lake. Let's build a jogway. Let's, uh, you know, have lights and fountains. Um, forget about biodiversity. Forget about people who actually drive. Uh, you know, draw on the resource for uh, various livelihood purposes. Um, and that's that's something that goes on. And that is also reflected in the way people tell you about these changes, right? So you go into a village and ask them about a particular lake that has undergone some of these changes. And they tell you, we don't want to go there anymore. They have erected big walls to keep us out, or fences to keep us out. Uh, they do not want people who are dressed like we are to enter the lake. Uh, so why should we even bother about what happens to it, right? Uh, yeah, he, uh, yeah, so I would ask Beryl to comment on the same question in terms of how mining industry has impacted a political environment overall and how do you see a political or economic changes that you anticipated having a similar impact? Um, how, how mining, uh, well, the, the causality runs from mining. I think I would, um, I would say well, the, the events on that started since Sunday, um, I mentioned very briefly at the beginning of, of my talk, um, there was a, a parliamentary elections in, in Kyrgyzstan. And um, they were the most diverse since, uh, since independence, actually. Um, but that led to uh, a, a turmoil. And now the country is, um, uh, is going through a massive protest that is, you know, that the elections are, are not recognized. And there are different um, clashes in the capital across the country. And um, you may ask why I'm telling you all these things. These things are really part of the reaction of, of a country that was, that was, you know, overnight dropped from transition from, I mean, there was not transition basically. One day you're part of the, your Soviet Kyrgyz Socialist Republic. Next day you are born as a neoliberal um, citizen and you're supposed to understand, you're supposed to get the uh, institutions right. You have supposed to get the uh, price right. But um, we know that institutions, you know, the, they are, um, they are not, born overnight as such. And so, um, but Kyrgyzstan really followed these these prescriptions. And what happened is that it was uh, not only way too quick, but the, the processes were um, from one extreme of state-driven policies over six or 70 years to the other extreme of we let the market do what, you know, the, the take care of the rest, but market is not created by itself. So on the one hand, there was a lot of state intrusion to create market, but on the other hand, um, the people were really, uh, they did not have an orientation. What they were told constantly is that um, if you are good enough, you will make it. And so it really gave this, this incentives of utility ma maximizing citizens that they, they have to find their way around. Uh, and they were quite left alone with this. 
And so many, not, not really every person is against mining in Kyrgyzstan. However, uh, having to deal with uh, the companies, you know, one day you have rebuilt your life and next day you have an Australian junior on your uh, doorstep that's excavating your pastures and, and uh, Kyrgyz people are nomads. So, you know, there's just more than a little bit unproductive hills for, you know, as the companies see. And so how to deal with that? And, um, the, the reactions on Sunday uh, elections are part of this being uh, being left alone and having it enough really with um, uh, push back and forth between state extremism or you know market um, uh, market hands uh, and and this is where a lot of resistance and a lot of protests coming in Kyrgyzstan I'm not saying that every every each one of one of it is extremely useful but we see that over the course of 25 years there it has a transformative um, power definitely and this is where within this vacuum and this is what what you know Ostrom uh, has worked all her life uh, is that uh, there is not just one or the other option and um, so I, uh, a lot of things are in the air we don't know how the country would, will develop but one thing is clear that um, uh, people are realizing that neoliberalism, the, the, the promises that it, it, you know, it came, the, it's far from being liberal. They want liberal values, they want democracy, but they don't want to be shut up and they don't want their struggles to be flattened out for the sake of expansion of um, uh, extractive industries. From that, they get really minor uh, contributions to their own well-being. So I was wondering, uh... How do you see a uh, gold as a uh, as a gold is a kind of a universal commodity where we see exchange? So how do you, how do you connect uh, like the, the mining of gold in a Kazakhstan uh, having an impact on a global economy in terms of how uh, do you see? Is there any connection? Do you find at a uh, top elite class? Well, um, Kyrgyzstan is, uh, so has really uh, significant deposits, gold deposits, but um, um, among the top uh, five or top 10 worldwide gold producers, it, it's not the place there. Maybe, you know, starting from um, 2025, 20, 2024, I think something like that. So there is some, some significance, but the significance of gold comes from, I think, the, the, re the relative context of what else is there in Kyrgyzstan that could drive the, uh, the, the economy, basically. Um, but when we look at, um, and it is an important part of the for foreign trade, really, but when you look at um, look at where uh, most of the gold really lands, uh, the exports land really uh, mostly in Switzerland or London, and we are talking about, you know, it is an, um, a matter of really uh, commodity accumulation, speculation, and um, it's not something that, you know, uh, we will talk about wheat in a bit, but it's, you know, it's not really wheat that you can do something with it. It's not, it's, I mean, even, not even coal, of course, coal has a different value, but for many people in Kyrgyzstan, you can just take coal out and you can warm up your uh, house. Uh, and gold in Kyrgyzstan has come to mean it really has really contradictory materialities, but one part of it is that um, there is there is not much you can do with gold. You know, you can divide a country with gold. You can do, you can support uh, corrupt deals with gold. You can do politics with gold. You can do you know, feed with gold. And um, but you cannot thrive on gold. Uh, this is the experience that Kyrgyzstan has made. Hita, do you want to say something? Nothing. I was just telling Beren, you should come to India. We do everything with gold. <laughs> yeah, so there are some couple of questions from the uh, attendees, which I would like to uh, ask. Uh, they, it's kind of uh, common to all or they have asking like, uh, uh, can you remind us like what kind of academic discipline grounded your work and uh, are you nearing the end of your study or what are your research questions actually? I'm happy to go first since uh, I'm probably newest in my studies. Um, so I'm a first year PhD student. So I would say I'm not even close to the end of my studies, um, which makes also the other questions quite easy to answer. 
Um, so I, I'm in a disciplinary program. The School of Sustainability at Arizona State University uh, is non-disciplinary. It's interdisciplinary. I guess it includes many disciplines. Um, and so I more draw from concepts from resilience thinking, um, from uh, Eleanor Ostrom's work, so work around the commons, as is obvious by this panel, um, and then social ecological system thinking. So uh, those are kind of the areas I'm drawing from and kind of bringing them in to think about how do local, how do, uh, what makes local communities resilient um, and local communities being a proxy for social ecological systems or a couple of human natural systems, however you want to talk about it, but how do these um, groups who interact closely with resources um, what makes them resilient to changes, um, to things like uh, changes in regulation or to global pandemics, um, uh, economic crashes, um, or introduction of uh, novel species or um, climate change. So what's next in my research program? Uh, refining and uh, narrowing my, my research program will be the next step. Um, and I have to say being a part of the early career network has been really helpful in that because um, you get to have a lot of conversations around uh, your interests and your ideas um, and, and get support and questions from your colleagues. So, yeah, uh, there is, uh... it's a general, let me suggest we take uh, the last two questions quickly Okay. And then move on to the next panelists, okay? Okay. So there is one question by the Bhagisri that uh, what is your point of view about the conservation and management of natural resources among the indigenous people? Uh, I guess, I don't know if anybody wants to answer this. Uh, Gita, do you? Um, I think Beryl is more well placed to answer that particular question. Yeah, okay, Beryl. Well, do you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I actually, uh, I don't feel, um, I, I don't feel uh, uh, to be the right person to answer this question. Of course, uh, the, um, the the issues and life projects of indigenous peoples within the extractive expansion is a very important issue, but. Um, I, uh, it is not my area of study and it is an, it is an area where s very precious scholars have been working on. So, so I don't think this is my place to say anything on this topic. There are no uh, self-recognized indigenous uh, peoples in Kyrgyzstan or, or there are different ethnic groups, but um, we have to give credit to uh, people who dedicate their work to this. So I, I will pass this question. Oh, okay. And I, can, there is I, can, I can touch on it lightly. Um, so within the uh, natural resource management and conservation context in the United States, um, many of these state and uh, kind of regional level agencies are in partnership with um, indigenous, counterpart indigenous groups. So for example, in um, Wisconsin, you have uh, the Department of Natural Resources, but you also have um, the Chippewa Nation or the Chippewa Nation um, and they work in partnership to manage uh, the fisheries as well as um, some of the other resources, lakes uh, in the area. So I think um, what what is my point of view on it? I think it's really productive um, when there's collaboration and ex exchange. Um, I mean, I'm going to take this broader than um, indigenous and just say that different knowledge systems and different ways of knowing are really important um, to the commons. And I think that the um, integration of local knowledge within the commons is one of its, um, not commons thinking is one of its strengths. This is my cap. Um, and so uh, I guess my, my perspective is, um, yes, indigenous people um, and indigenous knowledge, but also all people and all uh, different knowledge systems think about how to include that in conservation resource management. So there is another question by Prakash this, uh, that uh, how can they can distribute a common property? I guess uh, if anybody wants to answer this. Uh, this is kind of a uh, question. Um, I'm not sure Prakash what you mean uh, when you say how can they distribute common property? Uh, I'm not sure who is they, but I will attempt to answer 
how uh, at least Indian states have been viewing common pool uh, resources at least. Um, and if we, I mean, so if you look at a lot of these lakes and the associated commons that we see today, um, a lot of it is classified as wasteland by the state. Um, you know, they're, they're classified as fallow land. Uh, and that leaves it open for a whole lot of uh, repurposing and reinterpretation. Lakes probably are lakes, but anything that is associated with a pasture land or a forest or village forest or, you know, all of these things are being classified as waste, wastelands. Um, and that poses a lot of challenges for us in terms of how we define policies and uh, sort of uh, work towards engaging with some of these comments. I hope that answers your questions. But yeah, thanks. Yeah, so now I will transfer this uh, uh, floor to Maria. So she can. Maria? Hello. Well, thank you. Um, to include also a little bit of what has been asked about in general for for the um, from the our participants so far. So I'm an agricultural economist from the University of Bonn, as you can see, and I'm going to speak today about how commons and SES research pretty much opens up new perspective for governance and agricultural systems. And I'm coming here from my personal interest, as you see from the, my background. Um, I'm looking at plant breeding. So German winter wheat breeding has caught my interest for about like the last, I want to say five years, if not seven. <laughs> um, and thanks to many different practitioners and colleagues in, scientific, in other scientific disciplines like plant breeding, phytopathology, population genetics, I've gained, gained a real plethora of knowledge to bring back to my disciplinary home, so to say, which is agricultural economics. And I'm currently back crossing that with what I've learned from my colleagues in sociology and the governance. And of course, as we are here, SES research. And um, so next, please. <laughs> So if we start from an agricultural economics perspective and we go a little bit back in time, right? We've all had this historic nudge a little bit. Um, about 100, like for the last 100 years, um, and I'm talking 90-20 here, right? Like, so shortly after World War I, right on the brink of World War II, so hunger was a real issue. So when we're talking about like food security was at the time, um, not, like, not the term of food security, how we have it currently in, in Europe, where we are more obese than we are actually um, in need of food. Um, so it was a real issue and breeding, seed breeding and agriculture, everything went towards we need to raise yields we need to there was immense efforts in crop in raising uh, yields and crop production so governments invested a lot into agricultural research individual breeders became actually over over the years prospering firms producing new varieties and meanwhile we had the problem though that we encountered environmental pr um, problems and that's what we, so just say, term under the so-called intensification of um, agriculture. And the problem that we have here is that it brought with it the overuse of chemical fertilizers, overuse of crop protection agents, soil compaction through heavy machinery, and other yield enhancing inputs. So while intensification is on the one hand very good because we're not extensifying and converting land that would be there for biodiversity purposes into, into more agricultural land, um, it still has a lot of, there's still a lot of environmental problems. And up until today, we are in the point where um, seed breed, like plant breeding kind of like still holds this promise of maybe we can lessen this trade-off a little bit between food security and um, these environmental problems we have. So um, there is a social dilemma involved. Next, please. Um, 
And just as a quick reminder from an economics perspective, right, social dilemmas arise when individuals are tempted to take an action, but the collective will be better off if all or most individuals actually take another action. And here is where the Commons research comes in and can contribute a lot great deal to how, about how we solve our problems potentially in the future because the uh, um, underlying questions that I that I had here is so um, what is it that a fallible learner which is the um, conception of an individual that we're actually looking at in um, um, in, if we're going through an, from an S, coming from an SES perspective, can bring to this whole right. In um, the classical model we are looking at is a rational optimizer, and now we have from Commons research, we found or SES research, we have encountered um, this fallible individuals that can learn and adapt over time. And how does this change the whole thing? So. Next. Um, if we have a fallible farmer with learning capacity, what does this actually mean? Well, let's go to reality a little bit. Um, on the one hand, I would say it just, it means not just to outsmart our strengths against through technology, especially when we're talking about the, um, development of robotics and new IT systems and stuff like that. But it also means, um, right, like we, if you go, for example, to um, a farmer who is, uh, no, oh, sorry. <laughs> it also means to accounting for our, our human weaknesses, actually. And um, if we go to the example of trying to pick a variety for um, as a farmer for wheat planting, then um, we have this, imagine you have an ample set of different varieties, like 30 different things you can choose from. And one of them is, so to say, for your, you want to have on your farm then in the end and plant. And how would you do it? Well, usually farmers go about saying, well, I pick, pick what fits best, right? Um, to their farm. And then plant scientists go and are like, whoa, what does that actually mean, right? Um, and they pretty much say, you should pick what fits best to your ecological niche, right? So your biotic and abiotic factors, so your climate and the different diseases you have on your farm want to be respected. And then the other thing that the farmer also needs to take into account a lot of times is like, what kind of other qualities this, uh, do they want in um, in their in their in what they can um, produce right like baking qualities is a very important is very important for for uh, wheat farming and in germany we have a we have a we have a case where where farmers actually get help in this decision right like the german plant variety office supplies together with the state trials in each state of uh, germany different results each year that tells you which variety has which performances on what characteristics problem here is though these are not just like two or three characteristics and you can be like oh i'm gonna, just gonna put, pick this right like but you have 23 different uh, uh, variables you're looking at pretty much and then you go in and you need to way okay is yellow rust important me for me is brown rust important for me do i want to have i want to have a certain certain baking quality now how do i pick the um, the variety that had that so to say matches my ecological niche where i'm in right like where do i have that brown rust resistance that i want that yellow rust resistance that i want and oh god where is the the baking quality for this um so <laughs> As a normal human, you would probably like, I was starting this research and I was completely lost. So I guess any one of you who would just like randomly walk into this would probably feel exactly the same way. But farmers are really good at this, to be honest. They have loads of experience. They um, are pretty good at picking these uh, their varieties, especially if you look at the average yields over the last uh, 100 years. 
And um, please, next slide. Um, yet the question remains, why do we still have, like, what's up with these environmental problems that we have there, right? So there are different, uh, um, different ways of answering this, right? Like, why is there still too much spraying out there? So there are different possible answers how we could go and deal with this. One could be that we say, well, maybe there is just not, there are just not enough resistant varieties out there, right? That like have the right fit, right? Or another, another possibility to answer this might be that the combination of different varieties and attributes is actually not good enough, right? Like you need, as I just said, right? Like you wanna have brown rust and real rust resistances and all of the other categories at the same time. So what do you do if you don't, don't get that? So what we see from this is that um, seed are not just like a mere input, right? Like um, what we usually have with water, fertilizer or others, there are also technology that will, and an infrastructure that will provide a certain setup and configuration for what you can do and must do on your farm. And also they are a resource. And next, please. What that means also is that um, the lab, that the last aspect actually necessitates us to not only look at the farm, but to look at the whole system leading to the farm, right? It's the multiplication and the breeding that will also um, bring about what a farmer can actually choose from in the end, what kind of varieties to be there and what is the actual, actual agricultural system the farmer can set up. So, um, if these activities, so to say, preceding the farm do not de deliver the, des the desirable choices for all, so to say, then we have a problem in how we conduct our joint production in the whole system. <clears throat> Meaning that not only the right seeds are being created by plant breeders, but also that it's important to look at what's being multiplied. And it involves actually multiple social dilemmas, this whole system that we can see here, right? A level of the breeders, a level of the multipliers, and then the level of the farmers, what I just talked about. And um, each actor group has kind of their own agenda in terms of what their individual goals are in the air. Um, so the question is how we reach these societally desirable, um, desirable way, uh, ways of going about this and how do we solve these like multiple network interaction, um, situa these multiple network action situations and solve these social dilemmas at the same time. Um, and, oops. We have, what we have at hand here is large scale systems where we encounter problems that are going beyond the individual specific context actually. And um, we need a certain general, generaliz oh, sorry, oh, generalizability <laughs> um, to these, um, to, the, to our theories, <laughs> sorry. And um, especially uh, um, when we are trying to think about how we solve these, pu uh, these puzzles. Next slide, please. Okay. And um, I think we as common scholars, and now I'm saying specifically we, because outside of my identity as an agricultural economist, I would also say I'm definitely on the SES and common side. Um, we need to, so to say, balance this context specificity and this generalizability question so that we can come up with theories that will actually have, so to say, a value to somebody who is working in governance as well. 
And when we look at the governance of varietal diversity as what I just described, right? Like at least from what I found, I would say it's very uh, important that you have actors that get credible information and and then uh, to be capable to facilitate are facilitating different kinds of trust to um, actually facilitate these different coordination mechanisms that are active in these different parts of the social ecological system we just saw. And next. <laughs> Um, and as we encountered in the past already, like 30 years ago, right? Like we had this memorial lecture last week or the memorial panels actually last week, right? Our uh, professorial generation actually taught us that there is hope, right? Like not every social dilemma has to end in a tragedy and well, I would say this is a call to us as PhD students and postdocs because um, it means that we can go about this and show how to do it. Yeah. So, um, next. I'm giving over to Flavia. Thank you, Maria. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, John. Um, I am Flavia Guerrieri, uh, and today I'm uh, going to talk about uh, specific social ecological system, systems identif identified through and built around the use and maintenance of intellectual property tools, namely geographical indications. Just a quick uh, parenthesis, uh, my background is uh, legal studies, but I don't like to uh, be uh, considered as a legal scholar uh, because I really believe that interdisciplinary in interaction between uh, the study of the commons, institutional economics and the law uh, are really uh, important to, uh, to, to, to actually make a difference in, uh, in, uh, also in my domain, which is intellectual property. Um, so, uh, next slide, please. So, uh, what actually is a GI? In the European Union, we have two different kinds of geographical indications, protected designations of origin, and protected geographical indications. The first one are normally identified through um, a red label. Uh, instead, uh, the protected geographical indications are normally identified through a blue, blue label. But what actually protected designations of origin are is they are names. Names that identify specific products originating in specific places, region, or a country in exceptional cases, whose quality and characteristics are essentially or exclusively due to a particular geographical environment, meaning a mixture of the natural and the human factor. Protected geographical indications are, then are names which identify products originated in specific places, regions or countries, whose given quality, reputation and characteristics are attributable to their geographical origin. I want to show you the difference between the, these two labels that may seem similar but are, are not, which is a matter of flexibility. The first one, the PDOs, are stricter in their requirements. All the production, play, uh, all the production phases need to take place in the geographical area. The PGIs are looser, let's say, so they are more flexible. At least one of the production steps to make the product must occur in the geographical area. Next slide, please. Uh, so, but what, uh, what we are actually talking about is what we actually find in our supermarkets. For example, uh, European products. I have an example here in the slide, Prosecco or uh, Roquefort cheese. Uh, products that come from outside the European Union, for example, Darjeeling tea, Café de Colombia or uh, Cambodia pe pe pepper. But here, I would really like to encourage you to look at this product as the result of social, of, of, of actually of interactions that occur at the local level. 
here I put some uh, photo pictures of uh, the, the, the the places where the production takes place, and I really encourage you to, to see this product as the output of interaction between communities, uh, social trust, and also interaction with the environment. Next. Um, at the legal level, let's say, in a legal perspective, uh, the European Geographical Communication System can be seen as a multiscalar nested system, which is organized also uh, in relation to the regional, uh, regional scales. We have general standards and legal requirements uh, that are mm, embedded in uh, European regulations. Uh, and they touch upon different kinds of uh, products. For example, here I put the regulation for, for agricultural products and foodstuff, the regulation for wines and spirits, and the re regulation for aromatized wines. Then what happens at national level is that um, the um, member states directly implement the European regulation, but we can observe, especially when we have um, uh, very long-standing traditions in protecting geographical names in the national system, some national rules and practices that add on to the uh, European uh, legal requirements. Of course, they cannot conflict with them. They are every time compatible with the, with the, with the European regulation. But at the local level, what happens is that farmers groups can self-organize and craft the rules for establishing and governing the use of the GI. And the goal is ensuring the fair remuneration of farmers' investments, the reduction of information asymmetries, the protection against unfair uses of the name, because we are talking about names at the end of it, and as a side effect, which is important, uh, is the su sustaining also material and immaterial commons. I'm talking about material commons when I refer to the environment. I'm talking about immaterial commons when I, I, I refer to cultural heritage. Next. What happens at the local level is that when producers want to register a GI, they have to file a specific do document, which is the product specification. Product specification is a document which refers to specific characteristics of the product, the method of production, the description of the link between the product and the place, which is very important, and also specific rules concerning the labeling, packaging, and tracking. What happens is that uh, producers groups, they need to be groups, and they are in the majority of the, of, of the cases, uh, have to uh, evaluate the local assets, local material and immaterial resources, and then they have to negotiate in order to produce this document. They have to negotiate and find a compromise between different heterogeneous interests. They have to codify these rules or descriptive content in the case of the description of the link in the document. And once the geographical indication is granted, this document is a legal tool that can be enforced against possible infringers, people that use the name but don't comply to these rules. And the compliance to these rules and the replication of the content of these rules has a circular effect, let's say, in sustaining the local resources. But actually, this um, circle uh, is, uh, is, um, is always evolving. So that's why the European institutions have provided producers uh, some tools to keep up with uh, specific evolutions that they may encounter during this, uh, this process and also after the registration of the, of the geographical indication. And especially after the the registration of the geographic indications, uh, producers can file amendments. Next. Amendments are uh, a tool uh, which is uh, aimed to uh, adapt, to redefine these rules to uh, uh, specific uh, conditions, additional conditions. These conditions are, um, uh, are the result of the action of specific drivers 
These drivers can be internal to the producers groups or external. Here, I, I want to talk about a specific ex external driver, which is the addition of uh, new additional requirements to, um, to, uh, to the geographical indication system. What happens now is that um, in May 2020, uh, the European Union has released uh, this new um, uh, holistic uh, policy uh, instrument, which is the, uh, the Green Deal. And in the, in the um, framework of the Green Deal, uh, the farm to fork strategy. The farm to fork strategy uh, is, is the translation of the Green Deal in the uh, food sector. And uh, it is therefore aimed to cut the use of chemicals, reducing food waste, clear, uh, encourage clear labeling, uh, especially um, in relation to the nutritional components of uh, each item that we want to buy. And uh, what happens at the national level is that member states have to enact strategic plans which are based on specific targets and evidence uh, that, they, um, that, they will, uh, that will allow them to reach the specific targets in the time that has been uh, put as a overarching goal uh, uh, at the European level. And geographic indications are actually mentioned uh, because they will be reformed in the sense of adding new sustainability criteria. They will be uh, reformed in the sense that new sustainability criteria will be added to the actual regulation. So what, so what happens at the local level? What would be the impact of this uh, reform? Next. We don't know. The answer is that we don't know for the moment, uh, but uh, we know something uh, that is occurring uh, at stakeholders level now, which is uh, that the, the, the geographical indication systems are evolving in a certain way, but they are evolving not in the sense that environmental concerns are priorities in the producers' minds. And this, I'm referring to, 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 um, to, um, uh, to some studies that have been carried out by Quinones Ruiz and uh, Valescotti in, this, um, to, in the past years. They actually made an assessment of, of, that covers the period of the amendments that have been filed till December 2018. Uh, and uh, the uh, classes of products that have been covered are fruits and vegetables. And with observing this uh, evolution of the amendments, they saw that few amendments modifies, modified the rules for including environmental friendly practices, but they were very loose. The, the, the rules that have been introduced are not strict. And the majority of uh, the amendments are driven from, from other factors. For example, um, changes in market and consumers demand, introduction of new technologies and so on. So the real question is, how will the new strategy impact the, of the, on the robustness and resilience of already established GI settings, but also on uh, the uh, GIs that will be granted uh, later on? Next. I want to conclude with this slide. We actually can only make some, some considerations now and these considerations concerning the effect of the farm to fork strategy on GIs can impact anyway on amendments because new amendments can be filed and these amendments can be the result of specific inputs. For example, they can uh, touch upon rules on packaging, they can touch upon uh, rules on tracking, they can touch upon also nutritional components and labeling because this is a tricky question concerning uh, geographic indication products. Um, and all these changings that will not be really spontaneous uh, because they are uh, somehow um, uh, uh, somehow um, uh, stimulated by the outside from the exter these external drivers will um, have as a consequence higher, higher costs, including transaction costs for producers, and also will de will uh, demand a really really an effort for, from producer from the producer side to uh, push for the intergener intergenerational and cross-national exchange of eco-friendly practices in each of their, uh, on their, of their field of activities. But the most important thing is that 
the European authorities now are launching a message and the message is that the mindset of producers needs to change. The farmers need to have a proactive role and they have to shift their priorities. And this will be made only uh, if the uh, European institutions uh, are able to give farmers incentives, the right incentives to encourage spontaneous behaviors through, uh, in order to reach the, the sustainability goals. I thank you very much for your attention. Um, yeah, um, so I would, uh, I'm taking the floor now to um, provide the closing statement. Um, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, uh, Flavia. Today has been a very fascinating dive into the many perspectives, uh, the diverse perspectives and approaches that all of us employ to study different kinds of social ecological systems around the global south and the global north, from the Great Lakes Wisconsin partnership to conflicts around mining systems in Kyrgyzstan, agricultural systems and geographical in indicator systems in Europe. However, as diverse as these cases are and their contextual peculiarities are, there are several commonalities that draw all of us together. All of us are working around medium to large scale and interconnected social ecological systems um, with associated infrastructures and technologies influencing them. We are united by the presence of multiple social dilemmas across each case that demonstrate historical continuities, both in terms of the contextual realities of the contemporary social ecological landscape, but also you know, the way in which past dependencies influence uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, context, but also extend far beyond them in many ways. Each of us describe a diversity of users along with that associated potential for conflict across gradients of power that exist between people in the state, between and across communities, leading to and influencing environmental injustices of various kinds. We also engage with deeply polycentric arrangements existing across multiple levels and scales that may also be adaptive or maladaptive in the way they operate across the systems. There are diverse goals and preferences for social ecological systems uh, management and hope for commoners actually springs from the potential of incorporating place-based knowledge collaboratively with local knowledge systems through involving local communities and through processes of commoning along with nodal agencies and bureaucratic engagement. In closing, this really brings home an important message that Dane pointed out to us earlier and I quote, in a deeply polarized world such as ours, if we listen to and learn from each other to deeply understand the social, environmental and institutional contexts of the system we are a part of, we can come together as a people with a diversity of preferences towards a goal of overall system health. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Maria and Flavia and Hita for your last remarks. So now I will uh, uh, ask attendees to, if they have any question, please type in the chat box. And there is a one question uh, from the attendee for a Flavia. Uh, are you studying a GIE in multiple countries within a Europe, right? How challenging is that from the methods standpoint? Can you describe your research methods briefly? Yes. Uh... So I have uh, to make a small um, introduction to this because uh, actually my, I've been asked here to talk about transformation. So that's why I uh, focused specifically on, uh, on amendments, but I'm actually dealing with um, studying the new uh, possible system of um, uh, possible options for the new system of protection of geographical indications for non-agricultural products. So it is a little bit different, but the question can be answered anyway. I am studying uh, in my own uh, research the questions, um, the, 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 these questions uh, from a cross-national perspective. So I'm taking into account three countries uh, and the method uh, actually is a really challenging part because we, I have to take into account to make a comparison at least uh, similar classes of products because we have to be able to draw a comparison cross-national and more than uh, three. So it will, I will have to deal with more than three communities. And um, the method in itself is uh, qualitative, uh, empirical, 
So I'm, I'm just making semi-structured interviews. Okay. So there is another question for Maria. Uh, are you in graphic area you are studying? Is it happening at the regional or country level? Second is that what the next in your research on this topic? Uh, thank you for that amazing question. Um, so I, I actually, when I, when I saw it, I actually already drew out um, a very recent paper on seed comments that I can really recommend. I'll just put it in the chat and to whoever uh, wrote that, can you can look it up there too. Um, it's about seed comments from Stephanie sievers Klopbach and her colleagues. And um, very, and like the, the most recent thing I read so far, and I find the very comprehensive overview in there um, amazing. So check that out. Um, in general, I would answer that question. Um, yeah, well, seed comments, I would say that depends a little bit on how exactly you define that, right? Like I'm coming from a place where I say I'm looking at genetic um, and genetic and varietal diversity as the underlying resource stock, so to say, to my analysis. Um, and that's where I'm, so to say, looking at differences in traits between different varieties. And that's, so to say, my unit of, of my, my small unit of, of, of observation. Meanwhile, also saying that it's also a nested multi-tiered resource, right? Like um, where different actor groups will actually look at the same thing from a different perspective and therefore also call it a different, call it different names, right? Um, so that's why I also am analytically taking that apart a little bit for me. But, uh, while I'm actually t at, say, looking at all of Germany, right? Like my case is conventional winter wheat breeding for whole of Germany. Um, that's what I mostly looked at. I looked a little bit left and right, right? I, I also have talked to organic wheat breeders and um, that was also very inspiring. Um, in the sense that it opened up to me the fact that there is also a lot of different stuff out there and up and coming, which is also about what are I'm, the next question, right? Like, what am I going to do next? Um, I am, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm looking into sets. I'm actually looking at how uh, technology that we are developing currently at the University of Bonn in our excellence cluster is going to influence the robustness of these uh, breeding systems and um, whether this intensification of, um, so to say, harvesting from our genetic resources that we have in winter wheat, how that influences the systemic, systemic um, robustness overall in terms of how does that influence the genetic pool that we have for winter wheat. Um, yeah, that's it to say what's coming up next. And I'm really excited about it. Um, yeah. That's great, Maria. So to general, I'm gonna uh, break in now. Uh, we're at about four minutes from the top of the hour based on my clock. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you all, um, uh, you know, I'm trying to remember the history of the way this panel came about. Beryl, I know you took a leadership role of that, but I think you all did. Um, and I know earlier in the week, you folks, uh, Maria, I know you were leading it. I think you all were involved in some capacity in the early uh, career network um, uh, conference or mini conference. I don't know what you call it, but it was a two-day conference earlier in the week as a part of the world, world uh, network meeting. What's that? <laughs> we call it a network meeting. No, okay, great. So I'm just <laughs> wondering, you know, I, in, as we close, um, you know, the energy you guys have brought is fantastic. Uh, wh where do you see the ECN, the IASC ECN going? Uh, or what, do you, what would you like to see over the next year or two? Um, I, I'm getting a sense that it's, it's something you're finding productive. 
Uh, yeah, Maria, did you want to say something? Yeah, if, if I may. <laughs> Please. Um, well, what you've already seen, I guess, in the, in the aftermath of this network meeting where we had about 80 different PhDs, postdocs and professors coming from the whole world, um, we're, there are like collaborations popping up everywhere in the sense that different people got together. We kind of grouped them according to their topics. And then I think a lot of them took this as an entrance to, oh, there is somebody on the other end of the planet that can really, that I can relate to very well and that I can collaborate with potentially. So I'm hoping that a lot of like, that a lot more of this is going to happen. I mean, I don't know if it's gonna be like book clubs, discussion sessions, or whatever it is that you can do via Zoom too. I think this um, might be pot a potential for being very, very productive in the future in terms of what we can do and learn together. I'll also say- Yeah, go ahead, Beryl. Well, you probably know the history uh, of, of all of this better, Charlie, than me, when the council came up with the idea to have uh, what, what you have back then called a student counselor. And um, at the beginning of this year, we, um, I mean, we had from no members to, I don't know, I lost the count. I think we are approaching 40 by now. And, uh, you know, you were there also in Lima where we were trying to get a feeling for, do we need something? Do we need to build, establish something? And, and the rest is really what we are observing. And uh, such networks as are as good as the people that are members of. And um, I think the future is just, you know, it's just ahead of us. And, um, but we have to really thank you for inviting us to give this talk. And um, we, I do hope um, that this is the first one and that this will become a tradition that each year we will become uh, different members of the network, of course, uh, part of this. And we will talk about our uh, diverse commons research. Well, I have to say, one, I wasn't looking for any thank you. <laughs> that was nice, but I wasn't looking for that. Um, uh, and secondly, I find myself jealous because, uh, you know, I'm feeling, I'm starting to feel my age. And I didn't have this kind of global network. We didn't have the infrastructure we have now when I was going, you know, in an early career. So I'm excited for you folks, and I appreciate I know we all, all the attendees, too, I'm sure, appreciate the leadership you guys are doing. Um, uh, Beryl, I just want to point you, there is one question to you in um, the Q&A, but I think given time, we're at the top of the hour. Um, maybe you can, um, I don't know if you recognize the name, but email or uh, just wanted to point your attention to that. So can you go to the next slide as we close? Sure. Um, and I think there's also uh, um, uh, something in chat too, folks. Sorry, uh, attendees, that we're out of time. Um, so at this point, I want to uh, let me close this IASC Early Career Network uh, keynote address uh, with a few final points. Um, I just wanted to, we're getting toward the tail end now of World Commons Week 2020, um, but I wanted to remind people if they hadn't seen it, and it, I'm, I'm fascinated, we've had a really nice um, size of attendance for this. Um, and I, I know the attendees can't see the attendance list, but there's a good group of people still here after two hours. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen it, um, on the uh, World Commons Week 2020 website at the bottom, um, what we are doing now is we're linking the recordings to these in case you've missed them. So um, the first one is the North American uh, Governing the Commons 30 Years Later talk. Uh, next slide. Next slide, Beryl. And um, on October 3rd, uh, up one more, you go back to the Lima, or to, uh, sorry, the Latin America, <laughs> other direction. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, so this one's Latin America. Um, so Fabio uh, gave a talk in Spanish. Um, it was really a wonderful talk, as far as I could understand it. But based on the Q&A, it really was a wonderful talk. So that one's up online um, for anybody who wants to view that. Next slide. We had, uh, here's the Africa keynote that happened on October 5th. Again, that video is available for anybody who wants to see that one. Next slide. On uh, October 6th, uh, Oceana had their keynote address. Um, this one was unusual in that it, um, the speaker, Ann Polina, um, showed a 35 minute um, documentary she's made 
And uh, it was a beautiful documentary, uh, but she wants to be sure she knows where it's being seen. So what is on the website is the Q&A with her, which is fascinating. Um, the video um, is available, but she's asking you to, to email her if you want to see the video. And I, I just, it was a really fascinating film. Um, so next slide. Uh, we had Europe yesterday. Um, and again, the, um, the recording for Europe, uh, Achim's talk is online um, at the same website. Next slide. Uh, and what's also happened yesterday, which isn't yet on the, the website, is the, the China uh, keynote talk on COVID-19 from a Commons perspective. Um, that was given in Chinese. Um, but as soon as I get the video, I'll, I'll put that up online as well. Next slide. Almost done, folks. Um, now, the last one um, happens uh, October 9th in Japan, which is actually at 10 p.m. my time tonight. Um, so uh, Elaine uh, Delaney will be talking about Coastal Commons in Japan um, to close out the week. And let me just turn to, I think, two more slides, and then we'll be finished. So I just wanted to point you to, um, we also have had a, a number of local events. This, uh, as we all know, this very strange year, <laughs> um, to say the least, um, uh, uh, most of the local events have been online, um, but uh, I can happily say that we've had more organizational participation this year, in part thanks to the ECN network and what they did. Um, uh, that we beat our record this year. Each year we're getting more um, points on the map globally that are participating in the week. And I just want to plant the seeds to the attendees um, to, it's, no, it's not too early to start planning for next year, um, which leads me to my next slide. Next slide. So this slide, um, it's on the iascommons.org website, but um, next October at this time will be the biennial uh, ISC conference at Arizona State University. It's still an open question what'll happen, if it'll be in person or not. I think we all understand that at this point. Um, but uh, uh, you can see the timeline on the left side of the screen of when abstracts are due. Um, it'll happen one way or the other. Um, for sure. And then I wanted to point you to the right, uh, for some of you who may not know, but because of the strange pandemic period we're in, and because of the opportunity with Zoom and what, this type of technology, um, there's a whole set of uh, smaller online conferences that are coming starting February 24th. I won't read the list, but you can see. And so I um, really encourage you all to consider um, participating in all of these events. Um, and I'd love to see some kind of ECN, um, uh, something happen in the biannual. You know, I think we'd all love to see, we have to figure out what exactly that might be, but um, let's, let's go that way. Let me close with um, the next slide. And panelists, um, I, I have to say, I love the title of the panel, Commons Futures. I think maybe you, you meant that in the way I'm thinking right now in that, um, as the early career network, this is, yeah, <laughs> high five, Maria. Um, this is um, uh, the, the future of Commons uh, scholarship. Um, and so thanks for all you're doing to, to pull this together um, in the early careers, ne early network, career network. And um, uh, so thank you for your, your leadership. On behalf of IASC and the World Commons Week organizers, I'd like to uh, thank um, uh, the attendees for sure who've been here for two hours and are still here. Um, the, really wonderful that you're here and listening and encouraging. Um, I want to thank um, Beryl and all the panelists for organizing this, this panel today, to Gendra for moderating, and especially the panelists for putting together the hard work of putting your talks together. Um, they were really great. I enjoyed them. I'm sure everybody else did too. So we have no way to clap, um, but any of the attendees, if you can find the little hand, raise your hand, let's give high fives uh, to, to the panelists and uh, um, the, our appreciation. And yeah, some, some hands are coming. Um, on behalf of the IASC World Commons Week organizing team, thank you for attending everyone. Thank you for your time today. And if you like what you see, 
um, consider, if you're not, consider joining IESC as a member because there's more good things to come. So with that, I'm gonna close. Um, thanks again, panelists. Thanks, attendees. Um, have a great rest of your day, whatever time it is in your time zone. And I think we have a lot of broad geographic footprint represented today. <laughs> okay, cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again, panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. I'm going to try to uh, find my screen Thank you. to Thank shut you, down Charlie. the, uh, um, turn off the recording if I can find it. Thank you, Charlie, again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you guys you are awesome. For everything. We'll see you again oh, soon. Are we on I our hope. own?